evening, guys and gals, and welcome back. Uh, this is the Northern Miner Podcast, and I'm your host, Matthew Keevil. Uh, this is our episode for the week of August 29th, and we are sneaking up on uh, episode 30 here. So uh, we'd <laughs> I'd like to thank you for coming along on this voyage with me. Uh, this is It's been a blast. Um, once again, we are playing around with our format a little bit this week as we continue to learn. Um Leslie is on a well-deserved vacation. I think she's uh, kayaking uh, north of Vancouver in uh, beautiful BC here. So we do wish her the uh, best weather. Hopefully she has a good time camping. Um, I think she's back late next week, so we might be shorthanded for the next two episodes, I think. Uh, But don't worry. Have no fear. Uh, I have some really awesome content for everybody. Um, I mentioned last week I had a chance to sit down with Clive Johnson, the president and CD. Uh, president and CEO, that's correct, of B2 Gold. Um, so Clyde was nice enough to lay down some audio for us, uh, riff a little bit on uh, the, the B2 Gold strategy for building a gold growth, um, M&A, uh, sort of where he thinks the markets are right now. Um, so that is some really uh, cool insights that we'll have from Clive a little bit later in the show. Um, and uh, B2 Gold is an interesting story because they sort of bought during the downswing and built during the downswing, uh, managed to do so without uh, putting out too much equity either. And I think their stock traded to a low of about 80 cents at one point, maybe in January. Um, but now they have um, the Ojakoto mine, which they just finished building in Namibia. And then they're they're working on their Fakola mine in Mali. Um, and then they also have their Kiaka earlier stage project in Burkina Faso. Um, so they're an interesting company. They're making a strategic move into West Africa. Uh, historically, they've had their mines in Nicaragua, uh, Masbadi, which is in the Philippines, um, etc. Um, but now they're, they're sort of uh, building a presence in West Africa as we hear from Clive about that about where he thinks the gold price is right now what their strategy is uh, the internal growth pipeline and things like that so we'll roll that a little bit later um, that's some some really exciting audio and the other really uh, awesome awesome thing I have for you this week is uh, late or well midweek last week uh, I headed up to IDM Mining's Red Mountain property outside of Stewart in northern BC it's roughly like a Three hundred kilometers north of Terrace, give or take a couple east wests there. Um, but uh, headed up there with President and CEO Rob McLeod and Chairman Mike McPhee, Michael McPhee, um, and uh, they showed me around. We uh, had a chance to go into the underground workings. I have to say the ground conditions look pretty impressive. They're quite solid, so I, I don't foresee them having any ground condition problems. They are currently dewatering, um, so they're uh, got the pumps running up there or on, on the way to be running. Um, and then they're doing some exploration, some infill, uh, etc. What I have from for you this week is uh, Rob McLeod, uh, President and CEO, uh, was kind enough to give us a few sound bites on site uh, about a what their their field season sort of looking like this year, where they're spending the money, what they're working on, uh, what the strategy is, and then b they released uh, recently what uh, looks to be a potentially like really intriguing discovery at their Lost Valley prospect, um, which is uh, they did a trench there uh, and cut some pretty intriguing values, uh, and they they, uh, they they found a new zone um, that uh, the structure is part of a series of stacked high grade structures overprinting vertical vertical sets of porphyry style quartz sulfide veins. Um, and we went up there, looked around. You could see some of the the, the impressive like pyrite where they did this trenching. And in in a lot of projects, that wouldn't mean anything unless there's a there's a correlation between the gold and it. Red Mountain, there actually is a, a pyritic uh, association. So uh, it looks sort of interesting uh, on first blush on uh, the values they pulled. Uh, we'll get into it a bit later, but it, they look pretty impressive. So we have some audio uh, from Rob on that um, as well. Um, so yeah, without further ado, though, let's get into our macro because there was some sort of like. Well, yeah, really big news, I guess. I like it's. I'm getting sort of like numb to this whole Federal Reserve thing <laughs> because they just keep like you know like I have a headline here and it, it's uh, from one of the major banks or something and it, and it says like uh, the gold price is being held uh, hostage by uh, by J- Janet Yellen and the Federal Market Reserve. Like <laughs> they're really they're they they keep just beating it up because so what happened? Uh, I think it was late last week, like Friday. Uh, they're having a meeting in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And if you ever get a chance to go to Jacksonville, Wyoming, I highly recommend going because it's a beautiful place. Um, but anyway, so the uh, the Fed made some uh, insinuations. Uh, there's a few people on the Federal Open Market Committee that are pushing for, for as we've talked about, interest rate hikes this year. Um, so they, they sort of made uh, people are a bit worried again um, that they very, very well may try to push... Um, 
push through a, a uh, interest rate hike by the end of the year. Um, and I think there's like now, uh, I was just reading some stats. Um, traders seem to think there's like a, a 30% chance that they do it next month. And then it goes up to about 57% by December. So that's a, a so th- there's a likely by the end of the year, they seem to think there will be at least one. But I mean, we've been hearing this since the beginning of the year. Originally, they'd scheduled, I think, three to four hikes this year they'd wanted to do. They've yet to do much of anything. Um, so, again, we'll, we'll keep our eyes on it. Um, what it did have the effect of, uh, obviously, driving gold down. We're all familiar with the uh, the correlation between the U.S. economy and gold prices. Um, it sort of acts as a counter to paper currencies. We'll actually hear from Clive Johnson, does mention this in our little interview segment coming up. But uh, So gold's sitting at uh, $1,319 an ounce. Uh, well off, I think we had a... Th- we were sneaking up towards 1400 earlier, uh, earlier in the, in the uh, summer. Um, but, uh, now we're back down towards that $1,300 an ounce level. Um, I've heard some people say, if you, if you see around 1300 or a little bit lower, might be a buying opportunity. Uh, so we see we were, t- and, uh, Leslie and I always talk about summer doldrums. Historically, uh, the commodities do kind of take a hit in August before rallying into the fall. Um, so we'll see if, uh, it, it kind of looked maybe three weeks ago, like we might just bypass the, uh, summer dip altogether this year but it may well be here so uh, gold at $1,319 an ounce silver at $18.64 an ounce uh, copper's taken a bit of a beating on a narrative around oversupply or super oversupply as I've seen occasionally um, obviously uh, inventories are up uh, uh, people seem to think that the demand might not be there and that there's a lot of, of copper supply uh, that's just waiting in the wings to uh, blow the market away, even if it does. So copper's down at about 208 a uh, pound. Then we got uh, WTI oil at about $46.81 per barrel. So that's sort of our macro for the week. Um, yeah, gold's down a little bit. Uh, so it's it's a good time to be running. Uh, we're talking to our, I'll call this our CEO corner this week because we've got two CEOs, obviously one from the mid-tier production side, one from the junior exploration side, though IDM is moving towards development. Um, so it's uh, going to be really nice to get sort of a mm, sort of two, two uh, viewpoints on, on uh, what's going on, where uh, the market, uh, how development projects are going, uh, what Clive thinks about growth uh, is in terms of production and things like that. So w- without further ado, uh, I'm going to get right into this um, because it's uh, we probably have about 10 minutes of aggregate audio between the two CEOs. So I, I, I don't want to uh, do, I don't want to steal the spotlight here. I want to get right to this because there's a lot of really cool insights. Um, so firstly, Clive's going to talk a bit about uh, being a contrarian in so much as you're not sort of chasing the herd. When, w- what he's talking about is when gold prices are high, people tend to make, you know, the last cycle when we saw $1,800 gold, we saw a lot of companies running out just crazy about adding ounces, uh, buying things. Uh, then we saw that rash right down. So the first little bit is uh, <laughs> on how Clive views the market now, uh, what he thinks about sort of being a contrarian uh, M&A player, as he says. Um, so yeah, let's roll that right away. Uh, we'll get into this with Clive and I'll be back on the uh, flip side. So Clive, it's interesting because <laughs> um, talking, we've talked a lot retrospectively about M&A gold markets, your mm-hmm. investment thesis and stuff like that. Where do you think we are right now with with the recent somewhat you know rally you've seen in gold mm-hmm. prices? Obviously, that's done really good things for your FCF and for your mm-hmm. balance sheet. Um, sort of, where is your strategy sitting today? Well, I think that we're in a very we're in an excellent position because we were contrarian. So while we were building um, Ojikoto, we were acquiring for cola with his feasibility study, with his permit, all of that had to go, ready to go, and and we're able to finance it with no equity. So. Well, that's pretty remarkable in a pretty weak gold market. We financed a $450 million um, capital expenditure on the, on the mine with no equity. Um, so and, and basically about a 4% cost of capital or lower. So that was very good for our shareholders. And that, I had the confidence we could do that. And we got a great group of bankers involved. So we had bankers who believed in our vision when we weren't that big saying, we believe in you. And that was led by HSBC and a great bunch of banks. They've been fantastic. So so that uh, and that's a credibility thing as well, earning credibility of the banks. These are banks that knew us from the BEMA days. They know what we're about. They know we're long term. They know we're good, so so they didn't. So that was a, an excellent, an important part of it. So because we did the contrarian things, now all of a sudden, from January till June, they're all of a sudden everyone's going, okay, well, well, who's growing? Yeah. So now it's like free cash flow, yeah, yeah, but I want some growth. So who's you know who's the fastest growing gold producer in the world? I believe we are, and you know our production is going to go from around five fifty this year to 
nine to nine fifty by eighteen um, by just just by staying the staying the course, yeah. which is construction is going great at Focola ahead of, ahead of schedule, um, going, going great guns. It'll be in production by the end of the fourth quarter of next year. Um, with the expanded case, so we're talking about five million tons of throughput, right? Yeah. And we did that because yeah. we always try and believe we don't want to do what a lot of companies do, which is kick yourself three or five years later for having built something um, that you regret the size of the mill mm -hmm. because you didn't let you didn't let the explorers continue. Yeah. We have a very different view to this industry in the sense that it's it's about it's about the business of gold mining. Hence, this long term objective of being profitable and always trying to acquire things that make sense. So we're we're in the we're in the sweet spot, not because we lucked out, because our shareholders believed in our strategy. We weathered eighty cents a share. We got through it. We funded without equity, and and now all of a sudden people look around and say, well, who's growing and who's going to be a low cost producer? Well, our costs are coming down. They're going to come down even more with the new mines. I mean, Focola is going to produce something approaching four hundred thousand ounces a year with the expansion um, at you know less probably less than four hundred dollars an ounce. I mean, it's a world class asset. Once again, though, we didn't pay for the expansion upside there. Because yeah. we think that's got to be gravy. Now, if you had great expiration upside, frankly, we expect significant more than four million ounces out of Focola ultimately. But we didn't pay for that. So, so we sit in that great position of everyone's going to play catch up. And we're back, and yeah, so uh, you can hear from Clyther. They're, they are pretty uh, bullish on the growth profile and, and the assets in West Africa, so Africa specifically. Um, and B two did have a really a pretty stellar second quarter. Uh, they cranked out around 135,000 ounces, just north of that, at all in sustaining costs. And this is the important number of $731 per ounce. So literally, they uh, doubled uh, uh, operating cash flows. Um, and uh, obviously, higher realized gold prices, lower fuel prices played into that result. But uh, overall, a very good uh, very good quarter for the company. And uh, uh, the uh, other thing is, is, is when you talk about growth, obviously... Um, we t we've heard this sort of idea that it, as gold companies get bigger, as they creep above that $2 million per ounce production threshold, they tend to become a little bit, they can pretend to <laughs> tend to become a little bit inefficient. Um, and, and we've seen that in the last cycle with, with companies like Barrick and Gold Corp to an extent sell it. Now that, now that we're in the cycle that a lot of what we've seen over the last year and a half is them selling and, and refocusing. We've heard this sort of. Uh, tagline, you know, core assets, uh, you know, high quality assets, low cost. Um, so uh, sort of a flight away from just that we produce so much gold. Like now it's like, what's the quality of your gold? What are your margins? Um, and so the next little snippet from uh, Clive is just talking about growth um, and a little bit of commentary on the general gold market. So we'll get into a little bit on on what he thinks about M&A currently, um, where uh, where he thinks gold might be going and why, um, why gold. Uh, we talked a bit previously about the relationship to paper currencies and stuff. So he gets into that as well a little bit. So I'll run this and I will uh, see you uh, afterwards. The, we think the market would love uh, um, well-run, disciplined, dividend-paying, uh, intermediate gold producer. That's you know that, that's a great employer and responsible environmentally. All those things uh, in the range of I think it's sort of two to four million ounces. Four. And and I don't buy the argument that I buy the argument that if you get too big, it's tough for sure. And it depends on how many mind you have. What what changes as you get bigger is your target for size. Like, obviously, we wouldn't be acquiring a Limon mine anymore yeah, yeah. 60,000 ounces. We'd have to be looking for something now that had a chance to get to 200, probably, yeah. per, per mine or so, that type of thing, and with, with upside potential. So you change the size of your target, so you don't end up doing 20, 20 mines at 100,000 ounces no, a year. No, no, no. So you have to. So in that regard, and the way we run this company, and the management talent that continues to join this company, I don't think it's a matter of the, running the mines, per se. I think it's just a matter of the discipline and the accountability that you have to retain. Don't start using contractors to build mines. Don't build two mines at the same time. Just be as disciplined discipline as we've been and just keep it going and keep it going and keep bringing you guys along in the process and I think that we can we can do that we're not going to put a number like that out there that hard because I don't want to make a last bad acquisition because we're trying to get to two million or something yeah, exactly. right you let them come threshold. here let them come let them come we're not driven by that we're driven by just building this uh, to be a more profitable company yeah. building off our successes so in the future we'll maybe we'll consolidate West Africa maybe there, there's some consolidation we may be the player that does that mm -hmm. right now though I, we might have the next mine in West Africa already so yeah. um, in terms of um, 
the, the interest, well, what, I, what we've seen so far, I think, is typical of when the gold turns around. I mean, there's lots of reasons, in the, I think, in the world today to, 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 for people to re-examine the role that gold has played historically as a safe haven. Yeah. You know, you look at what's going on in Europe, you look at the Brexit, you look at Trump, you look at, these are all paper currencies with amazing amounts of debt. You never hear that discussed even in the U.S. election. You rarely hear the, the $3 trillion debt mentioned. Um, these are these are real things are real and it really questions the value ultimately of paper currencies yeah. and then that's the value of gold you know as it says in that video on Namibia the all the gold ever produced in the world would fit in my tennis court you know sort of 30 feet high that's absolutely amazing yeah. and so I think what you're seeing now is a, a little bit of a move into golds gold funds have finally got some money coming in yeah. that's kind of the first stage and now we're hearing we're seeing a little bit of, of generalists yeah now if they come in well, if they start coming in, that's when you know. Well, yeah. then you know. That, yeah. <laughs> well, then you look at a company like ours. You see, what I, what I, where we want to be in terms of the market is always, and I've always had this view that all gold producers are leveraged to gold price, of course, by definition. But I'd rather be leveraged to growth. We can't control the gold price, but we have some, we have some ability to control growth. Mm -hmm. So, so I, my, my thing is, if gold stays right where it is today, and we're successful in what we're doing, which we will be, and finishing for cola and continuing to run our mines well. Um, our stock's going to have a major re-rating as we go forward here mm -hmm. because of the fact that we're one of the only companies that has growth and based on the reality of that of that growth becoming reality. If gold goes up, that's complete gravy. So I tell people, you don't necessarily buy us because you, you want exposure to gold. You buy us because you want exposure to a great growth company yeah. that happens to produce gold. Right, right, right. And if we do what we're doing and gold ever goes up significantly, we're going to be the rock stars, oh, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I think the market right now is an interesting stage, but you know what? You know what bothers me? concerns me uh, and has for years is the lack of quality projects. What's the biggest issue in M&A? Historically, it's been crap projects. We've looked at everything. And I tell you, there are so, and now you see what people are paying for things already. It's just starting. So they sat out when we were doing acquisitions that made sense, they all sat it out. Now they got to come after stuff. And now it's suddenly, is uh, it's now become a seller's market instead of a, instead of a buyer's market. And yeah. it just shifted very quickly. So that's some cool stuff. So you could, uh, it's true like, uh one of the offsets of, of we've seen this huge rally in, in all levels of gold stocks is that, is that things become a lot more expensive as far as valuations, uh, but also it's a, it's a psychological thing where, where management can now raise money and, and people aren't handcuffed anymore financially, capital markets thaw. Um, and so, you know, it, it, things start to heat up. And, and, and as Clive said there, it, it becomes virtually a seller's market. So it, interesting stuff. Um, uh, so that, that sort of wraps up our B2 coverage for this week. Uh, but thanks again to Clive um, for uh, sitting down with me and, uh, and talking, uh, talking gold for a little bit. Um, I will have a paper article with a lot more in-depth comments. Uh, the interview actually ran close to an hour, so I have a lot more stuff. Uh, there may be a mining moment from Clive later this week. Uh, just uh, another little uh, tidbit from him. Uh, so yeah, let's move ahead uh, with IDM Mining because I was just up there at the Red Mountain property uh, outside of Stewart. Um, so interesting stuff. Uh, we flew up there uh, on, I think it was Thursday or Wednesday, last Wednesday, um, and uh, stayed the night in camp. They have a gorgeous camp up there, a beautiful property. Oh my gosh, right on the side of a glacier. Uh, some of the pictures and video that I took is just absolutely picturesque, like gorgeous stuff. Um, and uh, so we were up at IDM, as I mentioned, went through the uh, uh, underground workings, saw some really nice ground conditions. Uh, 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 President and CEO Rob McLeod sort of got into it, uh, talking to us about mine scheduling, where they're gonna, uh, what their plan is currently. Um, now, one of the things uh, that that Rob communicated to me and Michael McPhee, uh, the chairman, communicated to me while I was up there, is that they they want people to start of thinking of IDM. Uh, in terms of exploration upside, right now, obviously, they have uh, the they're working on the feasibility feasibility study for the starting mine plan. Uh, it's uh, it's relatively uh, small, uh, five six years, I think, is the mine life currently. Uh, nice grades though, um, and it'll be the underground operation. Uh, they'll be building up. Uh, a, uh, I think it's going to be a scalable plan, and one of the reasons is um, there is uh, a lot of sort of smoke or blue sky on the Greater Red Mountain package, and that sort of came to the forefront on August twenty fourth uh, when they released least some uh, high grade trenchings from Lost Valley. Um, and this was a surface trench. We actually got to take a look at it um, when we were up there. Um, and what they found was 33, to, uh, 33 meter long trench averaging 18.7 grams gold per ton. Um, and so that's a, a there was a, a higher grade a little area 61.4 grams gold over 0.8 meter so under a meter so a little high grade uh, 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 section there um, so uh, interesting stuff uh, the, the, Rob said they definitely got to get the drills out there uh, as soon as possible um, but you know what? I'll roll a little audio from Rob 
on the new Lost Valley sort of target that they, they're, uh, they're really excited about. Um, and then on the flip side, we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the field work they're doing up at Red Mountain um, and where they're kind of uh, hoping to end the year. So uh, let's run uh, the audio from Rob. This is on the uh, Lost Valley Trench, which uh, uh, IDM Mining released news on last week. Part of the duality of the story to Red Mountain, in addition to the near-term production scenario, is the fabulous exploration upside on the 17,000 hectare property. We recently announced a new discovery about four kilometers from where I'm standing here in an area that was recently exposed by the rapidly melting Cambria ice field, which is to the south of us. This area, uh, which was underneath the ice when I worked here in the early 1990s, uh, the melting has uh, exposed a whole series of quartz veins within a granite. It's a bit of a different style of mineralization from the mark zone, but it's nonetheless fabulous. And, and these are high priority drill targets for IDM. We just recently announced uh, some uh, channel sampling from a trench that we did. We could dig down into the talus only about a meter or so, but it's exposed a wide quartz vein with a lot of sulfide, so the average thickness was 0.84 meters and the average grade was about 16 grams per ton or half an ounce of gold per ton, as well as about two ounces of silver uh, per ton as well. We've been able to trace this in the trench, which is 33 meters long and additional 40 meters. So it's at least 70 meters wide. And it's part of a liniment that goes for hundreds of meters. Additionally, there's stra stack structures above and below it. We do not know how ultimately how thick this target will be, but it is a very juicy looking target that we can't wait to get some holes into in a few weeks. Yeah, so it sounds pretty, it, Rob's pretty excited about it and uh, we'll definitely have to pay it uh, close attention to those drill results uh, that will come out later this year, more than likely. Now, the, the other angle, uh, we have uh, briefly mentioned the, the production um, uh, scenario at Red Mountain. And uh, I had a chance to take a uh, quick uh, helicopter tour of the property uh, with Michael McPhee, the chairman. Uh, people might know Michael from uh, the AMEBC, our Curious Resources. Um, but uh, uh, he pointed out some of the uh, infrastructure and uh, sort of where the, uh, we saw the portal and things like that. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to run, um, and before I do, I'll just mention that um, Michael also uh, was uh, was quick to point out that, that permitting is going quite well up there. They have some good stakeholder engagement. Um, so things are pretty much on track for, for permitting the operation and the, and the feasibility study later this year. Um, but the uh, second little uh, uh, audio I want to run from Rob is uh, just discussing uh, broadly the field season, what their uh, IDM's goals are and things like that. Uh, so without further ado, let's get to it. Um, and I will see you on the other side. Start of the year, we've rehabilitated the uh, the under some of the underground operations to facilitate underground core drilling for metallurgical purposes, for geotechnical purposes, but also to upgrade the last bit of inf of uh, inferred resources to measured and indicated. And finally, we are doing some step out exploration drilling to expand our resources. All of this work is going to go. Uh, towards our feasibility study, which is currently underway, in addition to engineering work, uh, geotechnical drilling at our tailings and mill site location, road engineering, and uh, uh, baseline environmental sampling, which will go into our environmental application uh, to uh, as part of the permitting process. We have a multitude of uh, exploration targets, uh, one of which is the 141 zone, which uh, the portal is located right along the skyline. If you go over about 300 meters along a flat scree slope below Red Mountain is the where the 141 zone comes to surface. This is actually an area that hasn't been drilled. Most of the 141 zone has been drilled uh, from uh, over about 150 meters strike length, 250 meters away from the surface. So, and that zone cuts all the way through Red Mountain and outcrops in the adjacent valley in an area called Rio Blanco. Additionally, we have uh, the Brad Zone, which sits down in the bottom of the valley. This was last drilled in 1989. There's some beautiful visible gold uh, at that prospect. And it's just one of literally dozens diff of different exploration targets uh, that we have on the property. Uh, we continue to, we're gonna keep on continuing with our, both our underground work and our exploration work into the fall. We are currently planning more uh, resource expansion drilling using our underground rigs, and as well as we will be doing surface drilling uh, to, uh, to make new discoveries 
on the Red Mountain property. So yeah, exciting times for uh, IDM Mining uh, up at the Red Mountain property. We look forward to uh, some more uh, some more great news from them later this year. Um, there will be a, a stream of content coming out from my trip up there last week. Uh, we do have some video, as I mentioned, a little more audio, and I will be uh, writing up a uh, fairly detailed uh, look at the property and the company. Um, so yeah, other thing to just note is, is IDM did close about uh, an $11 million financing in April. So they do look well cashed up to chase down that Lost Valley target and continue on with their permitting and, and environmental assessment work. Um, so yeah, and that actually IDM dovetails quite nicely <laughs> into uh, into our uh, Yukon Mining Alliance sponsor. Uh, we'd like to thank the Yukon once again for uh, coming along for the ride with us on the Northern Miner Podcast. Uh, we do really appreciate it. Um, it, it. It's related in so much as IDM uh, acquired from Oban Mining, which is now a Cisco Mining. Uh, we've covered that uh, uh, previously. Uh, a Yukon portfolio, quite large, three hundred thousand hectares uh, properties in the Yukon. So IDM uh, does also have. Uh, significant holdings uh, up in the Yukon Territory. Um, and uh, as we know, uh, Rob's done some work up there previously. They're familiar with the jurisdiction. Uh, so that's great news. Um, so yeah, we'd like to get, uh, once again thank uh, the Yukon Mining Alliance for being our sponsor. Uh, the other little bit of uh, Yukon-related news um, that we should uh, take a look at is uh, Attack Resources is uh, stepping up to the second phase of drilling at the Rackla project. And this is uh, aimed at uh, chasing down the Orion target that they identified late last season. Um, and that's 300 meters west of their Anubis zone, um, uh, within a, a strongly anomalous gold and other elements, geochemical sort of, uh, signatures. Um, so we'll look forward to some, uh, some drill results, uh, coming out of attack. Um, uh, that, uh, uh, Orion target looks, looks pretty good. And we talked to, uh, Graham Downs during our trip, uh, up to the Yukon in July, and he was pretty excited about it. So that'll be something to pay attention to, uh, moving ahead as well. So lots of, lots of really cool drill, drilling going on. Uh, some really, really promising looking, uh, gold targets. Uh, this has been a very gold centered show, uh, and also the CEO corner. So yeah, Hey, new, new feature, the CEO corner. Um, but yeah, so that wraps up our, uh, our, uh, little slice, uh, little slice of mining for this week week uh once again thank you so much for listening uh we do appreciate it um and thank you to our sponsor the yukon mining alliance this has been the northern miner podcast i am matthew keeble have a great week and i'll talk to you soon